Good afternoon and welcome to the National Museum of the Pacific Wars webinar series. I'm Reagan Grau, Director of Collections and Exhibits. Today we're examining some World War II artifacts from the Philippines, which we will soon have on display in our temporary gallery. Later in May we'll install it, and the exhibit is entitled World War II in the Philippines in 25 Objects, and it will run through July this, this summer. The objects presented in this exhibit are not normally on display, but they will serve as points of entry into the war in the Philippines. I'd like to start off with this portrait painted by Filipino artist Crispin Villafuerte Lopez. He painted this in 1943. It's a portrait of uh, Prime, Japanese Prime Minister Tojo to commemorate Tojo's visit to the Philippines in 1943. Fast forward a few years during the Battle of Manila in February of 1945 after the Allies had landed on Luzon. Some Filipino guerrillas discovered this portrait in the presidential palace in Manila. Uh, they took it out of its frame and, and took it back to their guerrilla camp and were using it for bayonet practice. And when uh, an allied artillery officer, an American artillery officer named Pop Lemon discovered it, traded for it, rolled it up, sent it to his wife in the, in the United States, and in 1993, this portrait underwent considerable conservation to repair it, and it was donated to the museum in 2001. Next up, we've got this rare Japanese Maritime Bureau flag. The Imperial Japanese Army established the Maritime Bureau to operate in military-occupied zones in the Philippines by May of 1942 was occupied by the Japanese. And in order for merchants to operate in the area, they had to have registered with the Maritime Bureau. And this flag would have been received by a merchant vessel and um, would have been flown aboard that ship to, to, to show compliance with uh, having registered. And its uh, registration number was 217. And this flag was discovered in Luzon in 1945 and was captured there after, again, after the Allies had, had landed in the Philippines to, to liberate the islands. Moving on, we've got the, we've got a good luck flag that was given, these were typically given to Japanese soldiers prior to shipping out. They would have been uh, signed by friends, family, and the messages would have been uh, well wishes for good luck in battle or success overseas or you know, words of encouragement from friends and family. And it's on, it's on silk. And this one, um, this one was captured again during the liberation in the, of the Philippines by an American officer who was in the 8th Army. Farther along in the exhibit, we've got a bubblegum card here, number 20 in a series. This depicts of a Filipino Air Corps pilots attacking Japanese aircraft that are uh, invading the Philippines early in the war. And the point of entry for Army, Navy and, Army and Navy nurses is this silk shard here, 78 Army and Navy nurses were captured in the Philippines and were prisoners of war during, throughout the war. And this silk shard was signed by, it bears the signatures of several of those nurses that were captured early in the war. And those, those, those women, those nurses represent the largest group of women ever captured by an enemy of the United States. One of the more unique items in our collection is the POW Diary of General King. He was the commanding general at Bataan and was compelled to surrender. And while he was in captivity, he kept a diary, and this is the diary he kept while a prisoner of war. And it's the front end, the front half of this diary is a day-to-day -day chronology of events 
The first entry is from April 9th, 1942, the day they surrendered at Bataan. And it goes through the end of the war when General King was finally liberated from Mukden in China. And the front end of this, again, is a, a chronology of events. And the second half of it is nothing but recipes of cocktails and meals and things like that. So it's uh, safe to assume that these guys were thinking a lot about food while they were captives of the Japanese. Now, as a result of the surrender at Bataan and the fall of the Philippines, we had quite a few Allied prisoners of war and their experiences were uh, worthy of remembering, all of whom received a prisoner of war medal after the war, after they were liberated. And this object serves as the point of entry into their experiences during the war for this exhibit. Soldiers and sailors and Marines weren't the only people who were held captive by the Japanese. The, there were also plenty of Allied civilians in the Philippines at the time when they fell as well. And these little homemade, handmade stuffed animals serve as a the point of entry to, to describe the experiences of the civilian internees. There were several thousand Allied civilian internees who were held at uh, Santo Tomas University in Manila. And these stuffed animals were made by uh, a girl who was interned with her family. Her name was Liz Irvine. This scrapbook also helps us highlight the experiences of not only folks on the home front, but also people who were captive and held as POWs. This scrapbook was compiled by a woman in Rhode Island who had a friend in the artillery in the Philippines before the war started. And of course, he, uh, he passed away at Camp O'Donnell after the Bataan Death March. And uh, this scrapbook is filled with letters from him prior to the war from the Philippines to his friend in Rhode Island. And there are later entries in, in this scrapbook that describe her attempts at finding out what happened to her friend. And um, this letter in particular is dated October 1st, 1945, and it's from a person who knew what happened to her friend. And he describes in this letter when and where he died. There's also the story of the occupation because Japan occupied the Philippines during the war after, after they had uh, conquered the islands. And this is a, a constabulary pen. There was a, the Japanese had need for uh, law and order, if you will. And so a lot of the Filipinos who were constables prior to the war were recruited by the Japanese to continue their duties. And this is a constabulary pen that was issued to one of the Filipino constables. And this will serve as the point of entry to, for us to discuss what it was like in the occupied, during World War II in the occupied Philippines. Now, without occupation, there's no liberation. And so, in order to discuss the liberation of the Philippines, we've got this propaganda leaflet that was dropped and distributed in the islands prior to or during the Allied liberation. And this is just a, 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 a pamphlet here that encourages Filipino civilians to stay off the roads so that the Allied convoys can, can get where they need to go quickly. There was also considerable guerrilla activity in the islands and this Chris and wooden sheath represent the guerrillas in the islands. Now, there was an Allied officer who served with the guerrillas. He wasn't captured during the, during the uh, invasion of the Philippines, and he was able to stay with the guerrillas on the island of Mindanao. And the story behind this Chris is he traded a pair of dungarees for this for this uh, sword of 
Southeast Asian or Indonesian origin. Our next item in the exhibit is going to be this account, first person account of a POW escape. Now this POW escape that's described in this uh, narrative that's written by Melvin McCoy describes the prison break from the Davao Penal Colony on Mindanao. The Davao Penal Colony was so remote and so deep in the jungle, the Japanese believed that the jungle was the prison wall. But uh, Melvin McCoy, Edwin Dias, and eight other guys decided to attempt an escape, and they, they succeeded, and they met up with some Filipino guerrillas on northern Mindanao. And some of these POWs were able to leave the island via submarine, and these guys, Melvin McCoy and Edwin Dias and, and some of these others were the first uh, allied troops to bring word back to um, the allies of the Bataan Death March and some of the atrocities that were occurring in the, in the POW camps. And based on the testimony from Melvin McCoy and Edwin Dias, that, that led to that facilitated the decision to liberate the Philippines. Moving on, we've got a Purple Heart medal that was mailed to the recipient's mother because he received it posthumously. Uh, this serves as a, a way for us to speak about what are called hell ships. In the, toward the end of the war, the Japanese were a little desperate for labor back home, so oftentimes they took to shipping Allied prisoners from the camps to the home islands to work in industries. And the Japanese did not mark the ships that, the, that, these, that were transporting these POWs as POW ships, and so Unfortunately, the Allies would attack the ships because they believed that the ships were carrying raw materials destined for Japanese industry. They didn't know that they were full of POWs. And so uh, several thousand POWs, unfortunately, were killed by Allied attacks on the high seas because the ships just weren't marked that were transporting them. And so the recipient of this Purple Heart died aboard one of the the uh, Japanese merchant ships that was transporting POWs. Uh, moving, moving farther along, I've got two commemorative envelopes here that uh, show two different ships that were in the, the uh, Third Fleet. And these serve as a, as a way of, of discussing meteorology in the exhibit because these two ships were involved in the devastating typhoon from December of 1944 just off northern Luzon when the Typhoon Cobra smashed into Halsey's third fleet and some of these destroyers and smaller ships were unable to refuel because of the high seas and three of them ran out of fuel, capsized and sank. And there was plenty of loss of life unfortunately. Now, the, 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 the sailor who produced these envelopes served aboard the hull, it sank, and he was rescued by the Tabor. And these are postmarked in 1991, and they both feature World War II 50th anniversary commemorative stamps, if, if any of y'all remember that series from the post office. Next up, we've got a 6th Army a U.S. 6th Army shoulder insignia patch. And this was the, the army that first arrived during the liberation when they landed at Leyte in October of 1944. It was General Kruger's 6th Army. And the, you know, it's a six-pointed star that refers to the, the number designation of the army. The A, of course, stands for army on a, a green field, an army green field. Now, the Army wouldn't have gotten very far without the amphibious force. And this is a wooden plaque 
that came from the ward room of LST 454. Now the ward room is the room in the ship where the officers would take their meals. And this has all of the la invasion landings of LST 454. And uh, you get down a little farther, you'll see that they landed at Leyte nine days after, after, uh, after the landings began. They also landed at Lingayen. And they went to Cebu, also in the Philippines. So they made three landings in the Philippines. And this represents the seventh amphibious fleet. And that gives us opportunity to discuss how soldiers got from ship to shore and brought all of their equipment with them. All right, the next item in the exhibit is this map that is a pencil drawing of an attack track by a U.S. destroyer in Surigao Strait when the Japanese Southern Force was attempting to reach Leyte Gulf in late October of 1944. Now, what we have here is the track of the USS Ramey, and you can see where it launched a spread of torpedoes at the oncoming Japanese fleet. Now this is on some thin paper and it was produced by a sailor who was serving aboard the Ramey and he was in the radar room and he was in charge of tracking the ship's movements. And he somehow got a hold and was able to keep this map from, and this, this, this item allows us to discuss the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Since the Battle of Leyte Gulf was such a large engagement, we've got another point of entry into another part of that battle, the uh, Battle off Samar. And this flight helmet and these goggles belonged to Don Blanford. He was a, a gunner aboard a TBM, and he flew off of one of the carriers in Taffy 3. And Taffy 3, as some of you may know, was that small group of escort carriers, destroyers, and destroyer escorts that held off Admiral Carita's center force from entering into Leyte Gulf. And that's, these items will help us discuss that part of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And of course, you, you really cannot discuss World War II in the Philippines without talking about kamikazes. Uh, kamikazes made their debut during the liberation of the Philippines at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, particularly. Uh, these scraps came from a, a kamikaze plane that crashed into USS Kadishan Bay, and no sailors were killed, fortunately. A few were injured, but one of them was able to pick up these scraps and, and uh, hang on to them and donated them to us in 1997. And these are from that kamikaze that crashed into that aircraft carrier. We also have another shoulder insignia of another unit. This is the 1st Filipino Infantry Regiment. Now, there was a group of Filipinos in the California National Guard, and they eventually got sent overseas and were instrumental in, as part of the 8th U.S. Army in helping liberate the Philippines. So this unit was comprised of a lot of Filipinos, and so many of them were able to get back to the Philippines and help liberate and the islands. And I believe the 1st Filipino Infantry Regiment here was uh, assisted in liberating Corregidor. And what we have is a volcano emitting some smoke, and the three stars represent the three major islands in the Philippines. You have Luzon, Mindanao, and then the Visayan group. Those are the three major groups of islands in the Philippines. All right, speaking of Corregidor, here is a map of Corregidor that one of the paratroopers used when he jumped onto Corregidor. I think he was in the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment. And he was an officer in command of one of the companies. And he carried this map of Corregidor with him when he jumped and landed on Corregidor. And they're, they're probably very difficult to see, but there are some pencil notes 
on this particular map that he made as he carried it around in Corregidor. Our next item for exhibit is this 1911 45 caliber pistol. This was carried by Lieutenant Colonel Isaac Corns, and he was an officer in the segregated unit, the 368th Infantry Regiment of the 93rd Infantry Division, colored unit. He was a white officer. And uh, he had this pistol on him when he accepted the surrender of the Japanese garrison on the island of Yolo. And this serves as a point of entry into the war in the Philippines to talk about the Japanese holdouts, the last of whom was Lieutenant Onoda. And he finally surrendered in March of 1974 after a former superior officer came back to the Philippines and relieved him of duty. He was the last of the Philippine holdouts. Moving on, we've got uh, a peso, a Philippine peso here that bears the signature of General Yamashita. And Yamashita was the Japanese general in charge of defending the Philippines. And of course, he held out until September 2nd, 1945, when he finally surrendered. Of course, he was tried and executed as a war criminal after the war. But while he was in prison in Manila, uh, the soldier who was guarding him persuaded the general to sign this peso. And this was donated to us in 1989. Finally, we reach our last item in the exhibit. Now, Manila emerged from World War II as the second most destroyed national capital behind Warsaw. And this telegram will serve as a, a point of entry into describing some of the costs of World War II in the Philippines. Now, this telegram was sent to a set of parents informing them that their son had been killed uh, in, a, in a hell ship. He was, he was aboard one of the hell ships that was attacked. And this telegram came to them in June 1945, shortly before the war ended. I hope you all enjoyed seeing these artifacts and learning about the stories related to the war in the Philippines through these 25 objects. Now let's see what questions you all may have about these items. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jacqueline Mertz. I am the Museum Programs Coordinator, and I'm going to be helping Reagan here with moderating the questions that you all have. Uh, if you do have any questions about the artifacts or about the uh, exhibit that is now open, go ahead and put it at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A box. That's where we're going to be grabbing those questions from. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So while we wait for those questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and start off with my first one is, how did you actually come up with the idea for this exhibit? A few years ago in 2018, Roger Morehouse published a book called The Third Reich in 100 Objects. And I thought, well, we could do something like that with the, with the Philippines in our collection. And so I began to perused through collection records and found, found some suitable items that are not normally on display that uh, have compelling stories to tell. And unfortunately, time and space constraints limited me to only 25 objects. I suppose we could have uh, inflated the exhibit to 50 or more because we've got so many items related to World War II in the Philippines. Okay. Megan has a question. So she's talking about the peso that we saw in the video, and she's wondering why does the peso say peso? Well, the, the peso is the unit of currency in the Philippines, and that was probably some, I'd have to take a closer look at it, but that might be some occupation money or some, uh, some uh, military type currency, some military script that the soldiers would have used to operate in the marketplace. You know, after after the liberation and before the Philippine economy got got uh, reestablished, but the peso is the unit of currency in the Philippines. Okay, 
So from Donna, do we have any information or exhibits about the Filipino resistance during the occupation? The Chris and the wooden sheath is the, that, that serves as the point of entry for us to speak about the guerrilla activity in the Philippines. And that was the most compelling artifact that I, that I found in the collection among other edged weapons and other bits of clothing and things like that related to guerrilla activity. So, so yes, there's, there's quite a bit more in the collection related to Philippine guerrilla activity. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of material from, from Japanese participants, uh, Japanese occupiers, except perhaps those two flags and other flags like those. Okay. Uh, from Marissa, was everything donated by family or friends or did we find some at estate sales, antique stores? How do you find these or how do you get these artifacts? Usually uh, items are donated to the museum. We, we, we really don't go out and seek out items from estate sales or private collections or things like that. Usually uh, private, private donors approach us with materials related to individuals that, uh, that they would like to see preserved or uh, have a chance to be on display or or, uh, you know, they just, sometimes maybe the family is, you know, not interested in it anymore because the, that generation has passed or, and uh, they, you know, they just are looking for a new home for it because they're downsizing or, or what have you. But donations is usually how items arrive in the collection. Okay. So this one is from Timothy. Do we have any idea how many hell ships there were and how many of those actually sunk? Uh, in researching hell ships as, a, as part of this exhibit, I discovered there were, I think 156 ships. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 134 ships made 156 trips delivering um, POWs to the home islands, but that's not just from the Philippines. That was from all the, the places in, in the, uh, in the Pacific. And, um, I think 19,000 allied prisoners of war were killed as a result of attacks by allied, uh, surface vessels or submarines or airplanes. And I think some 1500 perished aboard ship just because of the appalling conditions. So it was a significant amount of lives lost as a result of uh, transport, transporting labor to the from, from points in the Pacific to the home islands. So this is from Michael. He has be, uh, begun finding what he can find out about his dad's World War II service. So does the museum or even you, Reagan, have a way that he can find out if there are any artifacts, books, or other information about the 88th Chemical Mortar Battalion? Well, whether we have any information in our archive about the 88th Chemical Mortar Battalion, uh, I can't say, because we only have what folks have donated to us. And we're not a national, we're not, we're not a, a repository for official government records or anything like the National Archives. We, like I said, only have what folks have donated to us. And if there's, um, there are a lot of resources on, uh, in the National Archives and Records Administration that would, that, uh, that would help you find more out about the 88th Chemical Mortar Battalion. Megan has another great uh, question for us. She's asking, how old is the museum? Well, the museum was incorporated in 1967 in February after, after Admiral Nimitz had passed away, actually. But uh, prior to that, a few years prior to that, in the early 60s, a group of locals here in Fredericksburg approached the Admiral and asked if uh, it would be okay to build a museum in his honor. And he said, absolutely not. Don't make it about me. Make it about the, the men and women that served under my command in the Pacific. And then you have my blessing. And so the, what we have today in Fredericksburg is a result of, of, uh, of those initial early efforts. And 
1967 is when the doors opened. So we've been around for quite some time. So we hope if you haven't had the chance to come visit us that you do. But this is from Doug. He's asking, uh, will the exhibit, is the exhibit permanent or is it temporary? And if it's temporary, when will it be taken down? This exhibit is temporary and it occupies the temporary gallery space in the George H.W. Bush Gallery at the museum. And we will remove this one from display at the very end of July. So it goes through July 31st. So if you have summer travel plans, and want to see it come before August. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again for joining us and taking some time out of your day for this webinar. And if you want to learn more about our upcoming events, go ahead and check out our website at pacificwarmuseum.org slash events. We have virtual and on-site events coming up. So we hope we'll see you either in person or virtually next time. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great afternoon.